be in power, your plan for the nations of the earth. As we prepare for worship, God, bring us to the mountaintop. Bring us to the mountaintop so that we may be strengthened to do your work in the valley below. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing with our hearts and worship contemplatively as Nicole leads us in a time of song.
Colossians 2 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we quiet ourselves before you and reflect on what it means to be given to your fullness through Christ, we confess that we cannot begin to grasp how it can be possibly displayed in our lives. Open our spiritual eyes that we might see what we know to be true, that we can be filled to the measure of all your fullness. Make this a present reality in the way that we live. Let's pause now in silence and ask the Holy Spirit to fill us. Lord, I bring to you First Baptist Church of Flushing, and I ask that each of us might experience your fullness in our lives in greater measure. We overflow, we pray, with Jesus. May we put to death the deeds of darkness, exposing them to the light of your presence through brokenness and repentance. May the fruit of the Spirit increase in our lives. May our living be motivated by our great love for you. May we be diligent in making room for your greater fullness. Lord, we cry out for those who are sick and recovering. We pray for Marlon Samosa, Lenny Brown, Marlene Chisholm, and others not named. Bring your healing touch upon them. May they experience both the physical and spiritual fullness in Christ. Unify us now in faith in you and the truth that we know of Jesus Christ. May we receive the word as we should, not as words of men, but as it actually is, your very word. Speak through your servant, Pastor Gary, today as he opens up the word to us. Fill him with the full measure of the fullness of Christ. May Christ be seen in him, and may the love of Jesus be expressed through him. Lord, fill us up with more of yourself. Conform us to your image. Accomplish this in us through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. We ask all this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 13. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain, where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. It was late afternoon as Jesus led his inner circle of disciples up onto a high mountain, Mount Hermon. And while they were on that mountain, suddenly bright beams of light started to blaze through the humanity, the covering of the humanity of Jesus. His face started to shine like the sun. Even his garments began to glow. Mark tells us that Jesus was transfigured. The word is transformed, changed. The literal word is metamorphosed. For a brief moment, the veil of his humanity was lifted and his true essence was allowed to shine through. The true glory that 
had always been in the depths of his being rose to the surface for that one moment in his earthly life. Or to put this another way, Jesus slipped back into eternity, back to his pre-human glory, giving his disciples a, a visible manifestation of his true nature, which until this time has eluded them. It was an experience those disciples uh, would never forget. John would later describe it saying, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth, John 1.14. Peter would reflect on that day with these words, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, 2 Peter 1. The glory of God is one of the mega themes in, in scripture. It, uh, it's referenced in various ways uh, more than 300 times. In Psalm 19:1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Isaiah 6, verse 3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's one of those mega themes in scripture that we, we, we talk about, we read about, but we don't really understand what this is. The glory of God, if you just want some sort of a definition, the glory of God speaks of the splendor, the beauty, the radiance, the brilliance, the majesty, the, the infinite worth of God. This is his glory. This is his glory. And at various times in history, the glory of God was revealed to the people of God. During the Exodus, God led his people with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The cloud is the, the glory of God. The fire is the glory of God. Theologians refer to it as the, the Shekinah glory, the immediate presence of God in this world. When Moses was on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, actually the second copy of the Ten Commandments, you remember he, he broke the first set, he got so angry at the people that he threw it on the ground. When he was up there getting the Ten Commandments for a second time, he prayed, now show me your glory. And God did. And God did. And that was the moment that God took Moses, he put him into the cleft of a rock, then he covered his eyes with his own hand and caused his glory to pass in front of Moses. The cloud came down, the glory cloud, and then God proclaimed his name to Moses. And then when Moses came down from the mountain, and this is written in Exodus chapter 34, it reads that, that his face was radiant. It was radiant. After being in the presence of God, his face radiated or reflected the, the glory of God. This ultimately is what Christians are meant to be in this world. Radiators of the glory of God. God's zeal for us is to think, to feel, and to act in such a way so as to make him look as glorious as he really is. We don't add to God's glory, we simply make it shine. We make it visible. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Then there was the cloud of glory that covered the tabernacle in the wilderness. You read about the tabernacle uh, in Exodus and the following books. That was sort of a portable church before the temple was built. And the, the cloud of glory covered that tabernacle whenever the people went in to worship God. And then there was the glory that filled Solomon's temple. The temple being the connecting point between heaven and earth. And then there was the, the horrible, the very sad occasion in Ezekiel 10 and 11 when the glory of God left the temple because God had finally had enough of their idolatry. Four awesome cherubim, four awesome angels assembled on the south side of the temple. Each one had four faces and four wings. Beneath each angel there was a turning wheel that was filled with eyes. And above the angels was a, a throne of sapphire. And as the angels took their place, the glory that filled the inner court of the temple rose above the cherubim, engulfing the sapphire throne, and then the dazzling glory moved to the door of the temple, and then east and upward from the city. It was an ominous scene. God had left, 
God's glory had left the temple. Like some of us, they assumed that God would always put up with their idolatry and their immorality and and their uh, injustice. They thought God would forever put up with them, but he didn't. Eventually, God's patience came to the end of its tether, and God withdrew his glory. And a name was given to this, Ichabod. Ichabod. It means the glory of God has departed. The presence of God has departed. And for the next 600 years, the glory of God was absent in Israel. God did not reveal himself in glory. There was not a cloud of God's glory. There was not a flame of God's glory. There was not a tabernacle with God's glory in it. For 600 years, it was a season of Ichabod. And then on a cold winter's night around 4 B.C., as the trembling hands of a carpenter, wet with the blood of birth, held his steaming sun in the, the starlight, an angel of the Lord appeared to some shepherds in a nearby field. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and, and the shepherds were, were terrified by this. The glory had returned in the person of Jesus Christ, but it was reflected in the panorama of an announcing angel. And as the shepherds cowered under the dazzling radiance, suddenly a vast company of magnificent angels and festal array appeared, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. The glory of God was returning in the person of Jesus Christ. But even though the glory of God had returned in the person of Jesus Christ, his glory was veiled within the humanity of Christ. For 30 years, Jesus looked and lived like an ordinary Jewish boy, an ordinary Jewish teenager, an ordinary Jewish man. And then for three years, during his three years of public ministry, Jesus was teaching and preaching and healing and working miracles as no one had ever done, but still his true glory remained veiled within his humanity. There were glimpses of God's power, God's omniscience, God's magnificence, but the true glory of Jesus was still hidden within his humanity, resulting in misunderstanding and ignorance by just about everyone, even his own disciples. And then something happened, something that Matthew, Mark, and Luke each record. Jesus led his inner circle of disciples up onto a high mountain. The inner circle was Peter, James, and John. Luke tells us that Jesus went up on that mountain with them to pray. Mark leaves that detail out. Luke tells us that's why they went up there, it was to pray. Jesus was preeminently a man of prayer. He would pour himself out in ministry. Then he would pull himself out of ministry and place himself into the presence of the Father, leaving us an example that, that we should follow. We pour ourselves out in ministry. Then we pull ourselves out of the ministry. And now we place ourselves in the presence of the Father. And that's what Jesus did every single day of his life. We're not told what Jesus prayed, but in light of the fact that he had just announced his passion, his, his death, his death on the cross at the end of Mark chapter 8, and in light of the fact that Moses and Elijah will speak to him about his death, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, we have a pretty good idea what he was praying. He was praying in view of the cross. And this moment marks the prayer life emphasis of the Lord Jesus Christ as it pertains to the cross, which will reach its climax in Gethsemane in Mark chapter 14, when Jesus prays while sweating great drops of blood, being in agony over the spiritual suffering that would come upon him on the cross, he prays in Gethsemane, take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Now it's entirely possible that that's the first time Jesus prayed such a prayer, but I tend to think that those, those thoughts were somehow in his heart and mind even as he prayed up on this mountain. Is it possible that this cup can be taken from me? The transfiguration of Christ is the answer of the Father to the prayer of the Son. And essentially, this is what the Father says to Jesus. My son, you must go to Calvary. But to prepare you for those dark hours, I want you to know that that which lies beyond all the suffering is the glory of the kingdom of God. 
And I want you to know, my son, that even though you will be forsaken on that cross, even though you will experience hell on that cross, that I love you, that I love you. In Luke 9, verse 29, Luke writes, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. In other words, Jesus was transfigured by the Father in response to this prayer. Jesus didn't transfigure himself. This wasn't just a, a, a magic trick to show his disciples. Hey, guys, come on up here, watch this. But as he was praying, he was transfigured by the Father. Notice also, communion with his Father changed his appearance, as it had done for Moses in Exodus 34. Now, often we think of prayer as a way to get what we need from God or to get what we want from God. We, we pray because we need stuff. I need a job, so I pray. I need wisdom, I ask God. I, I need patience, I say, God, give me patience. I, I need to pass an exam, God, help me to get through that exam. And certainly we should pray for our needs. Uh, James writes in James 4, 2, we, we have not because we ask not. So at the very minimum, you know, prayer is a means of of receiving from God. But when we pray, we not only receive answers from God, but God transforms us and changes us as we pray. Now, most people are aware of this, and so when they write books on prayer, sometimes they emphasize the former. You pray because you want God to move. You pray because you need God to provide. And other people go to the other extreme and say, no, you, you pray, and it doesn't matter what you say or what you receive because the purpose of prayer is for God to change you. It's both. It's both. God transforms us, and he changes us as we pray. Jesus was transformed as he was praying. And I tend to believe that prayer changes us in a way that Bible reading does not. You know, most Christians emphasize one or the other. Some spend more time in prayer, others spend more time in, in the Bible. I guess if I look at my own life, I probably, the pendulum probably shifts more to the Bible reading, Bible study side of the equation. But prayer changes us, and prayer does something in us that Bible reading does not. Paul explains this in 2 Corinthians 3.18. He says, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed, and, and that's the word metamorphosed, same word, transfiguration. We are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Do you want to be transformed? Do you want to be changed? Do you want to radiate God's glory? Do you want to become stable and strong in, in this uh, unstable world? Do you want to see your life and, and your character and your outlook begin to change? Well, then you have to pray. You have to pray. You have to come before God in his presence, contemplate his glory, and intercede. While he was praying, the glory of God explodes out of this humble carpenter from Galilee. The veil is lifted. The veil of his humanity is lifted, and his glory shines forth. This is who Jesus really is right here. This is how he existed in eternity. Jesus is without beginning or end. He did not begin to exist when he was born in Bethlehem. He has existed for eternity, without beginning, without end. Before there was a heaven, before there was an earth, he existed in communion with the Father and the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons, enjoying one another and glorifying one another for eternity. But because of our sin and our desire to irradiate our own glory, not his, Jesus broke away from that glorious communion, veiled his splendor, his beauty, his brilliance, his glory in the garb of our humanity and came down and lived among us for two reasons. One, so that he could reveal God to us, so that he could explain God, exegete God, help us to understand God, and then two, so that he can go to the cross and die in our place. Paul talks about this, uh, unpacks this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. One simple phrase. He says, Jesus emptied himself. Jesus emptied himself. 
That doesn't mean that, that he rid himself of his divine glory, but that his glory was veiled in his flesh for a time. He gave up the independent use of his divine attributes. He took his magnificent splendor, majesty, and glory, and it was hidden within his humanity. And then he walked through this world as a human being, in his weakness and in his humiliation, but the glory was there, hidden deep inside, veiled beneath the sackcloth covering of his humanity. Perhaps the greatest writing prophet in the Old Testament was Isaiah. If you've never read Isaiah, read that. It's a challenging book. Trust me, it's a challenging book. Isaiah's calling is recorded in Isaiah chapter 6. And you're, you're familiar with Isaiah chapter 6. In that moment, the curtain between the world that God dwells in and the world that God rules over was, was pulled open. And Isaiah was able to look in into heaven. And he writes these very uh, well-known words. I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him was seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. What a vision to have. That was given to Isaiah. And we say, well, who did Isaiah see? Well, he saw the Lord Almighty. Years later, John wrote in the gospel bearing his name in John 12, verse 41, Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Isaiah beheld Jesus before he got off his glorious throne and entered our realm as a little baby. Before Jesus comes in humility, he rules and reigns in spectacular glory. The train of his robe filled the temple. Jesus spoke of his pre-incarnate glory in his high priestly prayer in John 17. He said this in John 17, 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And for just a few moments on top of Mount Hermon, the glory of Christ, the heavy, infinite brilliance of Christ, was unveiled and made visible, and the disciples were allowed to see Jesus as he was in heaven before he came down to this earth, and how he will be in the kingdom that will come at the end of this age. Now, if you want to know what it will be like to be in the presence of Jesus at the end of the age when this fallen, dark, messed up world is no more, you just have to turn to the end of the book of Revelation. And in Revelation 21, verses 22 and 23, we read these words. John says, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Say, why don't we need a sun in heaven? You don't need the physical sun because you have something even brighter than that star. You have Jesus, and he will radiate his glory for eternity. The centerpiece of the new creation is the throne of God, and seated upon it will be Jesus Christ with his glory radiating out from it. There will be no sun, no darkness, because Jesus' glory will radiate forever. And those whose sins have been forgiven by the blood of Christ will enjoy it forever. And like Moses, we will radiate forth the glory of Christ. And I have news for you. This will be the happiest that you have ever been or ever will be because this is what you and I were created to do, to be in his presence, to bask in his glory, and to radiate his glory, and it will never end. You say, boy, that sounds a little boring. Doesn't sound like I could do all the fun things I'm doing in this world, you know, pre-pandemic, of course, right? The fact is, this is the happiest that you will ever be because this is what you were created to do. Anything you do in this world that makes you happy, anything that thrills you, anything that you're holding on to is absolutely nothing compared to that moment. Verse 4. And then there appeared to them Elijah with Moses. Luke adds three words that Mark leaves out. In glorious splendor, 
and they were talking with Jesus. So Moses and Elijah show up out of, out of nowhere. Now, I don't know, ever wonder how Peter knows who they are? How does Peter know that's Moses and Elijah? I don't know, they weren't wearing name tags, right? Maybe Jesus simply spoke their name when they showed up. But for some reason, Peter knows this is Moses and this is Elijah. Now, these guys have been gone for a long, long time. Moses has been dead for 1,400 years. Elijah left 900 years prior. Remember, Elijah didn't die. Elijah got a chariot ride while he was still alive up into heaven. Good for him. I'd love to be able to go that way. Moses died, and God buried him, and God is the only one who knew where he was buried. So they both had unique endings to their lives on this earth. And now, all of a sudden, after over a thousand years, they show up in glorious splendor, indicating very clearly that death is not the end of life. Everybody's terrified of death, I get that. But death is not the end of life. Their presence on that mountain is a foreshadow of what awaits us when we leave this world. Life goes on after we die physically. Paul writes in Philippians 1, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. So here's a man, Paul, who was looking forward to the day that he would close his eyes for the last time because he knows that the moment he dies, he is in the presence of Christ. And when he compares the two, he says there's no comparison. Going to be with Christ is better by far. It's not even like a, a, a first and a close second. It's a first and then everything else stinks. We who have believed in Jesus Christ can unmoor our boats and sail out on the sea of eternity with the greatest cheerfulness and certainty. Death is not the end. In fact, if you're a believer in Christ, it is the beginning of your best life. This is not your best life. And if you're young and still working on your best life, the best life you have now is nothing compared to the best life you have then. We have nothing to fear in Christ. I find that a lot of people, a lot of Christians in these days, living with great fear. Fact is, we have nothing to fear. We have absolutely nothing to fear. My life ends, I go to be with Christ, which is better by far. Mark tells us that they were talking to Jesus. Well, what were they talking about? Again, Luke gives us the details we need. In Luke 9.31, he says, they spoke about his departure. The word actually means exodus, his, his death, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. They spoke about the cross and how Jesus would, would die and rise and return to glory and how he would redeem out of this world men and women from every tribe, every nation, every, every language, every people group. He would redeem them. He would bring them to himself so that one day around his throne in heaven there would be multitudes upon multitudes of people from every walk of life, every tribe, every nation around his throne worshiping him and enjoying him for eternity. They weren't discussing any of the silly things that we talk about and the, the sillier things we post about. The theme of heaven is the theme of the cross and the redemption of fallen sinners. And the verb tense, for those who care about verb tenses, indicates that this was an extended conversation. So they, they were talking with Jesus for quite some time about the cross. Like, what an amazing sight. If you could just try to, try to imagine this. Luminous, dazzling Jesus, flanked by Moses and Elijah in their heavenly glory, and they're talking about Jesus' imminent death for our sins. And so, in, in a very real way, we were the, the subject matter of that conversation because he's dying for us. He's doing this for us. The presence of Moses and Elijah was very significant. Why Moses and Elijah? Why, why not uh, Isaiah and Abraham? Why not David and Jehoshaphat? Why not Amos and Malachi? Moses represents the law. Moses was the great lawgiver. He wrote those first five books of the Old Testament. Elijah is the greatest Old Testament prophet, the greatest of the prophets. He represents the prophets. And so together, Moses and Elijah were the ultimate summary of the Old Testament economy. And so on this mountain, 2,000 years ago, the law and the prophets were carrying on a conversation with Jesus Christ 
indicating that the law and the prophets testify of him. As Jesus would later say to his disciples after his resurrection on the Emmaus Road. You have to read about that yourself. It's at the end of Luke's Gospel. The whole Bible is about Jesus. The whole thing is about Jesus. Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets, which is pretty much a summary of the entire Old Testament. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. In other words, Jesus was the fulfillment of everything toward which the law and the prophets pointed. Jesus fulfilled what the sacrificial system was teaching. That without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Why, if you go back into the Old Testament, why, why were there altars and, and billions and billions of gallons of blood spilled on those altars? Because without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sins. But, but the blood of animals could never atone for human sin. We're above the animals. Jesus is the ultimate Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the whole world. He fulfilled the Old Testament priesthood. That's why Jesus is referred to as our high priest. He is the ultimate high priest. He is the one and only mediator between God and humanity. There is only one go-between, and that's Jesus Christ. He fulfilled every messianic prophecy, hundreds of them. He is the fulfillment of everything toward which their religion and their history had been moving. The predictions of the prophets concerning the Messiah were realized in Jesus Christ. The holy standard of the law, which no one could ever live up to. There's not one human being on this earth who's ever lived or whoever will live who could keep that law perfectly. Jesus perfectly upheld the law. The strict requirements of the law were personally obeyed by Jesus Christ. And then when we come to faith in Christ, we are credited with his perfect life. So when God looks at us, he sees us as having completely fulfilled the law. The men who appeared before Jesus, Moses and Elijah, they they were great men. They were two of the greatest men to ever live. But Jesus is greater still. If you go back to Mount Sinai, Moses reflected God's glory the way the moon reflects the sun. But on Mount Hermon, Jesus produces the unsurpassable glory of God. It just emanates out from him. Moses reflects. Jesus produces. Jesus doesn't point to the glory of God, as Elijah and Moses had done. Jesus is the glory of God in human form. And his glory outshines both of them. The author of Hebrews put it like this in Hebrews 1 verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Well, if there was ever a time for silence, this was it. If you were there on the mountain and you had just experienced this, this was a moment to be silent. This was a moment to contemplate, to consider, to reflect, to worship. But enter Peter, a man who always had something to say, even when there was nothing to say. Verse 5. Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And then in parentheses, he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. And anytime you see a parentheses in Mark's gospel, that's Mark giving us a little commentary of what's really going on here. How did Mark know that? Because Peter told him. Mark is writing Peter's gospel. He didn't know what to say. He was scared to death. Now, you would have been scared, too, because you would, have, you would know that in the Old Testament you could not see the glory of God and live, and now they're, they're seeing the glory of God, and they think, well, this is it. It's over. didn't occur to Peter not to say anything, and it's clear here that his mind is far behind his tongue. I've been there myself, so I don't want to be too hard on Peter. But I think this is what Peter is saying here when he says, put up three shelters and so on. What he's really saying is that this is a really nice life group. This is a great life group. James and John are here. They're my, they're my best buddies. They're, they're in the group. And, and now, you, now Moses and Elijah, these two, these two giants of the Old Testament, they're back and they're in the group. And now here's Jesus. He's shining. He's bright. He's glorious. Let's just stay on the mountain. 
Let's put up some shelters and let, let's stay here for a long time. And I think it tells us that once you get a taste of glory, once you get a real taste of, of God's glory, there, there's no going back. There's no going back. Once you taste the glory of God, once you experience it, really experience it, and then you look back at the world, the world is nothing compared to that. And I think the reason we're so attached to things in the world is because we are not experiencing his glory as he intends for us to do. Now the problem here with Peter, and this is a, a common sin for us, is that he's trying to indefinitely sustain a mountaintop experience rather than returning to the hard work and the devil-filled world which he's been called to serve. He wants to stay on the mountain. Uh, who could blame him, right? I mean, I'd, I'd want to stay up there myself. But I think instead of pointing a critical finger at Peter, I think we ought to say, if only we longed half as much to be in the presence of Jesus as, as he did, individually and corporately, we will be completely transformed. Completely transformed. I think the one thing the church needs today more than anything else is revival. Revival. We need to be revived again. Up there on the mountain, we're, we have a glimpse of our eternal joy. God wants us to enjoy it. He wants us to enjoy his presence now and be, be refreshed by it. And that's what's happening when we gather together. But he doesn't want us to stay on the mountain. We, we don't gather together in church, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's not what we're called to do. He wants us to gather for a time to be refreshed, to celebrate, to worship, to have our batteries recharged, but then he wants to get us off that mountain and back into the world because there's work to be done in the valley. The world is suffering because of sin. The world needs Christ. The church needs shepherds and under shepherds and workers and laborers. Because men and women who come to faith in Christ, they need to be made complete in Christ. They need to be discipled, built up, and sent out. Immediately after Peter says this, a cloud appears. It's the glory cloud. And the glory cloud comes down and it envelops Jesus, Moses, Elijah, and the disciples. Glory comes down unto glory. Glory on glory. Double glory. Now, this is a staggering moment because God had told Moses that no one can see my face and live. Not even Moses. The great Moses was able to see God's glory directly. God had to put him in a rock and cover his eyes with his own hand. Moses could only see God's back parts, his hind parts, whatever that means. Well, why is that? Why, why, could, why could they not see God? Why could Moses only glimpse the back side of, of God? The answer is, because there is an infinite gap between God and humanity. We don't like to admit that. We think that, hey, God is God and we're us and we can kind of stroll in and out of God's presence anytime we want. We can hang out with God, we can talk to God, we can chant, we can do whatever we want to do. Fact is, in our present condition, we cannot endure the presence of God's holiness. We cannot endure his glory, his infinite brilliance. It would destroy us. But here on Mount Hermon, the, the glory comes down, glory on glory, and the disciples enter that cloud, but they're not destroyed. This is something new. They, they are surrounded and they are embraced by the brilliance of God, but they live. And the question is, what's really going on here? Because this is something brand new. God is showing us that if we are with Jesus, if we belong to Jesus, if we are united to Jesus by faith, then we could stand in God's holy presence without being destroyed. Why is that? Because Jesus is the bridge over the infinite gap that separates God from humanity. Jesus was destroyed on the cross so that we might live eternally in heaven in God's presence through him. And that's ultimately what we learn from this great scene. Only with Jesus can you enter into the presence of God. Only with Jesus can you stand on God's holy mountain. Only with Jesus will you have a place in God's holy heaven. So if you stand before him one day, 
without a Savior, without Jesus, without his perfect righteousness robe around you, you will be separated from God for eternity and cast away forever. Not my words, the words of Scripture. And then God speaks from the cloud. He says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Now, this is the father's testimony of the son. And I wanted to say this for what it's worth. It doesn't really matter what your professors say about Jesus. It doesn't matter what some textbook on religion in Barnes & Noble says about Jesus. It doesn't matter what, what people on, on Facebook say about, about Jesus. The father says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. There is no higher authority than God the Father. And God says, this is my son. Jesus is the son of God. And because he is the son of God and all authority is found in him, all authority, all wisdom, all truth, the father then says, listen to him. Now we need to underline that because this is a command actually given to all of us. Listen to Jesus. The world, full of darkness, full of deception. If you don't believe that, then you're pretty deceived. Everything that's coming at us in this world, everything, I mean everything, it, in one sense, uh, it's, it's a deception. There is a God of this age that Jesus refers to as the father of all lies. And whether it's through media or, or through music or through movies or through books or whatever, we are being fed a very steady diet of lies and, and deception. And the father says, listen to my son. Jesus will light your path. His word will keep you in the truth because his word is true. Colossians 2 verse 3, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The writer of Hebrews begins his letter by saying, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. Jesus is the ultimate expression of truth, and God wants us to listen to him. Listen to Jesus when he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John 7, 37. Listen when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the one who made that exclusive claim. You may not like it, but he made the claim. Listen when Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Which road are you on? Listen when Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Listen when Jesus says, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Don't look at these events today, the, this pandemic and all the, the calamities in the world and say, ah, this is it, this is the end. He's coming back now. You don't know that. Jesus could come back before we hit the benediction. Jesus could come back before you put your head on your pillow tonight. Jesus might not come back for another 500 years. Do not try to read the signs of the times as though they're tea leaves telling you when he's going to come back. Listen when Jesus says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Listen to Jesus. Verse 8, suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. The glory cloud was gone. Moses and Elijah gone. Jesus' face and garments no longer glowed. The voice of the Father was still. And the three disciples saw only Jesus, backlit by the galaxies that he had actually created. This is what all of our theology, all of our preaching, all of our teaching, all of our work should come to. Seeing only Jesus. Seeing only Jesus. Don't look at me. Don't look at Pastor Aaron. Don't, don't admire us. If you admire us, don't admire us. Just a little bit. Admire Jesus. See Jesus. Love Jesus. If you see me, if you love me, if you admire me more than Jesus, then 
either you did something wrong or I did something wrong. And when this happens, when we see Jesus, then we will honor God in our worship. Then we will love all lives as we should, no matter their color, no matter their class, no matter their creed. Then we will give our lives in God's service. And then we will not lay up for ourselves treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. A few months later, a few months after this moment, Jesus was hanging from a Roman cross. And when the mob looked up at him, they saw a criminal, a deranged man, a pitiful figure, a victim, a liar. And in reality, it was the glorious Son of God rendering himself up voluntarily for our sin and for our salvation. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, he says, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This is why his glory had to be veiled, so that he could go to that cross. The transfiguration, in my humble opinion, is a proclamation of the costliness of our Lord's sacrifice. He appeared with his disciples in glory, but instead of going from that mountain back into heaven, for the second time in his experience, he left the glory and came down. He came down from the mountain and continued his journey to the cross, even though he tasted his glory again for a second time. And he goes to the cross where he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken, he was condemned, that we might be forgiven. Peter wants to keep Jesus on the mountain. Can't blame him. Who can blame him? But Jesus left the mountain, laid aside his glory a second time, and resolutely set out for Jerusalem and the cross, the writer of Hebrews says, for the joy that was set before him. The joy being that he might have us with him for eternity in glory. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. On the cross, the Prince of Glory died so that we might live. Open your hearts. Embrace him as your Lord and Savior if you've never done that. And if you have, worship him, contemplate him, and listen to him. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we do the best we can with this just unbelievable passage of Scripture. <coughs> Father, I pray that by your Holy Spirit you would take this word, this passage, this moment in history, and that you would seal it into our hearts, that you would plant it deep within our hearts until it begins to resonate within us, until we're able to say with, with Peter, I want to stay in that moment forever. And may that be the moment of our day that just gives us the fuel to go out into this world and to love this world, to love the people of this world as we should, to seek them out, to bring them to Christ, to serve the body of Christ, to invest everything we've got for your kingdom until that day when you call us home and we see the glory of Christ for ourselves. This is my prayer in Jesus' name.
wondering and thinking to yourself, who's the masked man? Is this Chris Pratt? Has he made an appearance out of quarantine? Sorry to disappoint. It's me, little Tony. <laughs> we want to welcome you to First Baptist. We have about 20 or so people here. Welcome. We're thankful that you've been able to come and worship with us. Uh, at this time, turn to the person to your left. Wave at them. If you want to turn around, wave. If you're at home watching, right? hello. Greetings to everybody in the chat. Uh, we're into week two of us having services uh, live here in uh, FBC with people in attendance. So, uh, of course, we are ab uh, abiding by all CDC guidelines and also all uh, state and local ordinances as it pertains to social distancing. So, uh, with that in mind, the way we're doing this is we're having limited people come into the church at this time. So, if you're if you've been watching from home for the last few uh, months and you've been itching to come back to FBC to worship, no problem at all. If you visit the FBC Flushing uh, website, there is a link right on the home page, landing page, where you can register and just fill out how many people would be attending. You fill out your party size, your names, your email, and you'll be emailed a ticket. Obviously, you won't be charged for it, uh, but you'll receive a ticket and that will guarantee you entrance into our services in uh, next week but just keep in mind that if you want to attend each service you have to go back to the website and register each and every time one registration is not a blanket registration so if you want to come next sunday register if you don't want to come the following sunday don't register but if you want to keep coming every sunday make sure that you register that way and of course just if anybody is uneasy at home about how our social distancing methods are being implemented here Trust me, I'm looking around, it looks amazing. We have a temperature check in the front. My wife, Melissa, has brought some aids, uh, some um, uh, guides and uh, specific materials to help anybody who is interested in knowing more information about how they can self-diagnose in the event that they potentially have symptoms of COVID-19, where they can get tested, so on and so forth. And then of course, uh, once you've done the temperature check and you check out, there are hand sanitation locations available where you can sanitize, or of course you can go to the bathroom, wash your hands. And here in the sanctuary, we have uh, sectioned off places where you can and cannot sit. And what I like about it is the parts that are uh, taped off actually have Bible verses. So it's a nice way of telling you you can't sit here, but here's a motivational verse to encourage you. So anyway, all that to say, if you're interested in coming in the following Sundays, make sure that you register on the FBC Flushing website. All right, enough about that. I'm sure that a lot of the kids are missing Sunday school. No need to worry. We have Kids Connect, which is meeting on Saturdays online. This is for kids uh, pre-K through grade six. If you're interested in signing up your child for Kids Connect, please contact Carol Tom or Soraya Sina uh, by email. Uh, if you've received the bulletin electronically, their email addresses are located there. Uh, then we have the FBC uh, quarterly prayer event, which will be hosted via Zoom on July 18th. Uh, we're going to be praying for the attributes of God. So please take this as an opportunity to join us for a morning energized with opportunities uh, for praise and worship, guided prayer, and corporate prayer, along with virtual prayer walks and Thanksgiving reports. So this is going to take place on Saturday, July 18th from 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. Again, this is going to be through Zoom. Uh, it looks like they're going to be uh, two different sessions, actually three different sessions, with the second session being uh, broken up into three subsections. So kind of, like a, kind of like a breakout session, if you want to call it that. Um, so if you're interested in attending that or participating, you can contact Robert White. Uh, his email is rwhiteusa at gmail.com. Also, his email is located in the bulletin that you receive via email if you receive those. Um, the, if you email Robert, that will give you the link to Zoom in the, uh, for the event and all the event materials. But in your email, please make sure that you indicate which session you would like to attend for session two. There are three options. Again, you can get all that information in the bulletin, the virtual version of the bulletin. Of course, we have our Monday noon prayer sessions. Uh, they meet every Monday via Zoom from 12 to 12.30. If you're interested in attending, please contact Pastor Aaron for more information, but there, there's, those meetings meet via Zoom, so you can get a Zoom link for that as well. And then if you are new to the church, uh, or if you are a, a born-again Christian uh, already and you've been practicing but 
FBC is your new home and you want to become a member and become active here in FBC, uh, Pastor Aaron will be kicking up again with his baptism and new membership class. Uh, again, this is a great opportunity for you to profess your faith in the event that you're a new Christian. But from a more macro perspective, this is a great way for you to connect with uh, the church at large. Uh, your membership allows you to participate in quarterly uh, meetings that the church has. And of course, it, it will help in terms of uh, participating in any other uh, extracurricular activities here at the church. So if you're interested in becoming a new member or becoming baptized and becoming a new member, uh, please reach out to Pastor Aaron. He'll give you all the details on that. Um, I'd like to shift uh, this portion of our announcements to the opportunities uh, for you to give. Uh, as, it's been the as has been the case every Sunday, we have uh, multiple ways of giving. We have it through our Tithely app. Uh, if you haven't signed up for Tithely, get on that. We also have an opportunity for you to donate via the church website. And of course, if you want to do it old school style, you want to come into the church and drop it off in the mailbox, or you can mail it, that's fine. Um, if you're here in service, there are two uh, offering plates right here up front where you can, at the end of service, please drop those uh, offering envelopes uh, down there. And of course, we thank you for your loyal giving to the church. Uh, it's, it helps immeasurably, and of course, um, the money goes uh, towards the, the improvement of our, of our church and the growth of our church. And I'm sure many of you have been seeing the wonderful updates of our new building going up. It's very encouraging in light of the, the bleak nature in our society. So anyway, all that to say, we hope that you'll give and we thank you in advance. But at this time, let's pray for our offering. Jesus, we thank you so much for this time of uh, fellowship. We thank you that um, in spite of a pandemic, we are still able to come together and worship and uh, especially doing it under very safe circumstances. Father, I pray for our offering at this time. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, motivate people to give cheerfully uh, and that all the, all the donations, uh, all the offerings will be towards the improvement of our church, God. We thank you for this time of worship and we glorify you in your name. We ask this, amen. Would you all rise for the benediction? Receive the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Uh, please depart this way. And if you have a moment, could you stick around in the what do we call that? Sidewalk? In the sidewalk. We would love to just chat and hear a little bit from you. But if you have to go, you have to go. Go in peace. <laughs>